Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. The sun is out and warm weather is calling. And with bright new designer pieces from Stony Clover Lane for Target, you'll be ready for every spring adventure. Dropping April 2nd, this limited time only collection is filled with candy colored, customizable accessories, swim, outdoor fun, and more. Mix and match and personalize essentials for wherever you're going. Whether you're headed to the beach or around town, there's never been a better way to express your personal style. Stony Clover Lane for Target drops April 2nd in most Target stores and Target.com for a limited time only. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the main streets of Los Angeles, California today. Sitting here at the running crib at 317 Gimmick Street. Right next to my illustrious wife, Kristen. Now, I was back here in this bedroom, Kristen, and there's only a chair here. It's a single chair. I got a little ottoman that you got on Amazon. I got my pearl beer neon clock on the floor. And there's a lamp on the floor. And there's a couple <laughs> of shades hanging in front of the windows here. And I stepped this room off a while ago. It's 11 feet by 10 feet. That is my podcast space. I ain't even got a table up in this son bitch. And then you come in because I've been struggling here to come up with an open after running my errands, going to get some gas in my Bronco, all the idiots out there on the streets of Los Angeles not using their blinkers. <laughs> and I come back and you damn near want to sit on my lap on this chair. And there ain't enough room for the both of us. Can I go outside and get you a lawn chair or something like that? <laughs> No, because you want me to sit on the ottoman, and I'm not going to sit on the ottoman. Shit, I mean, I, I just sat on the ottoman. You can have a damn chair. <laughs> We've been married, what, we've been together for about 12 years, married for almost eight. We don't really sit this close too much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Well, it's just, it's the day after Valentine's. I'm feeling a Oh, man, I felt like, I, I really felt like shit yesterday because I called com and I was going to order some flowers, but I forgot to. And this is, you know, one of my spots on my podcast. I told everybody, hey, don't get in the doghouse. Now, shit, I'm in the doghouse. Were you mad at me that I didn't get you no flowers yesterday? Because you actually got me a card. And some chocolate. Oh, she got me two <laughs> Reese's peanut butter cups in the shape of a heart. And I ate both of those son bitches. They were good. I busted my diet for them, but they were good. So anyway, I was talking about keep, keeping people out of the doghouse. And I didn't order you any flowers. I didn't get a card. I didn't get you nothing. Are you disappointed? No, I'm not too disappointed. You're not too disappointed. <laughs> so you're somewhat disappointed I didn't do a goddamn thing. Actually, that doesn't really bother me at all. <laughs> so, but we don't really do that we kind of do, stuff. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, if it is, it's kind of like it's cool. But, you know, I thought about making you one. Get a piece of notebook paper, fold it in half, you know. You've and, done that before. Yeah, when I was too stupid to go buy something <laughs> properly at the damn store. But, you know, it was from El Corazon, the heart. That's Spanish for the heart. Well, I did do some online shopping yesterday, so you technically did buy me something. <laughs> well, what did we buy? I bought myself a new pair of uh, shoes. <laughs> okay, that's a good Valentine's okay. gift, ain't it? Good, yeah. Yeah. We'll put your shoes on and go do some shopping. <laughs> Got a refrigerator, and there's chock full of stuff, and there ain't nothing in there that I eat. What's the deal with that? It's the skinniest full-size refrigerator <laughs> I've ever seen in my damn life. you got to put everything in there sideways. Plus my blue apron stuff. <laughs> well, I tell you what, Blue Aprons, one sponsor of this podcast, my wife's having a field day with this shit. <laughs> yes, I am. What do you like so much about the Blue Apron? Uh, I like it because you don't have to measure anything out. It's all measured and done for you. You just mix it all together and you have a dinner. It is so simple, and that's a shoot. Everything that comes in there, you just put it in, and it works. Yeah. Even I can get it right. You could. But, you know, I kind of like, you know, I just do my one course. Well, I do my two course meals. I'm a protein and carb guy. Yeah, but I'm doing the vegetarian option on Blue, um, Blue Apron, so. Oh, so they got a vegetarian option. Yeah. That stuff that I had the other day we used pretty good. Let's see which one. Oh, yeah, that's pasta. It was pasta, a pasta yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was good. pretty good. You know, I was talking about Blue Apron. I was talking about Valentine's Day. Uh, well, why don't you go over to Walgreens today and get me some uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Hearts because they're 50% off today. Because you ain't going to eat them. <laughs> And I'll end up eating them. Okay. It'll be about 2 in the morning. I'll be on my little zombie patrol, and I'll go in there. My willpower will be like at an all-time low, and I'll scarf those motherfuckers down. That's why I ain't going to go buy you some. And here's the thing. When I do get you some and you hide them, sometimes, well, I'm, about, I'm about 500 because sometimes I find them, sometimes I don't. And sometimes I'm glad I don't. But sometimes I'm frustrated when I don't. 
And we're in this new place, so you wouldn't even know where I would hide anything. No, we got so much shit next door from the remodel. They're putting in this garage because the mud guys there, they're putting all the shit, the mud, the stucco, whatever it's called, and getting all the uh, walls uh, skimmed, skimmed, skim coat, make them all uh, a smooth texture. And they brought all this shit. And we had uh, one of my gun safes brought over here. Your piano was over here. Uh, the dining room table is over here, so we ain't barely got any room to put anything. And in the that garage right. is already. Yeah, so by the time I go out two there, two feet and by look, three feet. Yeah, <laughs> that is like you've heard of a one car garage. This is a shoot. It's a one car garage. When you pull in that motherfucker, you might not have room to open your door and get out. You probably have to crawl out Dukes of Hazard style through the damn uh, open window. It's not even a one car garage. It's more like a motorcycle garage. <laughs> yeah, I can put my little scooter yeah. in there. Son of a bitch. This place is starting to get on my nerves. I mean, I've settled in. It's kind of our home now, and it will be till about April, middle of April, whatever hell it's going to be. <laughs> Have you talked to Randy, the contractor, and got some 411 about when we're going to be able to move back into our house? Because shh, it, it's looking really nice over there. It's very open. The, the granite guys still got to do all the counters. I mean, there's a, there's a shit ton of work to still be done. But what's the ETA? <laughs> I don't know. It changes every single week. So, Do you want me to buy you another chair so you can sit in here and do a podcast with me or what? No, I'm fine. You know, I've got some pretty cool people coming up on a podcast, uh, but it's not like really i got a place to podcast. Uh, Hunter McIntyre came over the other day, and I dragged the table into here, and I had to turn it sideways and get it through the door. And that was a pain <laughs> in the ass. I think I'm going to talk to one of the five-finger death punch guys. And uh, who else am I talking to? I'll talk to some other uh, bodybuilder. Oh, no, no, uh, Tom Finn, the powerlifter, is coming by in a couple of weeks. No, next week he comes by. I see him all the time on Instagram and Twitter doing all kinds of crazy feats of strength. I think that guy's got a couple of screws loose. He might need to get into the business of pro wrestling. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> My wife did not know me when I was in the business of professional Thank wrestling. Thank goodness. And sometimes when people send me stuff on questions at steveaustinshow.com and I'll play the – uh, YouTube video link, and she'll look at it, and she'll shake her hand, and goes, man, you were crazy back then. Yeah, you were. Well, but I've mellowed out. I ain't crazy no more, right? You're just crazy in the head now. Crazy in the head. What's that <laughs> supposed to mean? Like you were physically crazy in the WWE. Okay. So now well, I'm and mentally, crazy. too, actually. Now it's just a single layer of craziness. <laughs> but you with your special education background, I think that's what makes us such a good one-two combination. Well, I'll I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so what's on your schedule today? You done? Well, I had to take Hershey and Mula to the vet. Uh, how's Hershey doing? She's getting better because she had that pneumonia. It's still, I still have to keep her on antibiotics for another probably two weeks. So it's, if it's it the longest case of pneumonia I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, well, she had that bout of sort of pancreatitis that one week because somebody left the egg yolks in the garbage for well, her to get to. Well, I didn't expect the dog at 12 <laughs> years of age to get into the damn trash can because she never was really a trash dog. Well, well, nonetheless, it flared up, and so anyway, she, she ate no twelve yeah, egg yolks. Up. Yeah, so the high fat content threw her yeah. pancreas, pancreas into a cattywampus state, and she had to take some antibiotics for that. On top of the walking pneumonia, well, how's Moolah? Her ear infection gone? Ear infection's gone, all cleared. Because we've got a nice, healthy, happy family over here in this house. Yeah, we're sitting so close to each other looking out this window. I'm going to need a shoehorn to get out of this. Time. A shoehorn or a crowbar. I'm going to have to call 911 to get the paramedics to come over here with the fire truck, go through the window, and wedge me out of here. <laughs> we might be stuck here. People will come here in like a year, and there'll be two, uh, two skeletons sitting here with microphones in their hands. <laughs> yep, looks like this is where they recorded their final podcast. <laughs> no, but it feels good to be so close to you, baby. <laughs> uh what are you doing? <laughs> my wife is rubbing on my head. Are you trying to seduce me? I don't have a choice but to rub on your head because you're so close. I can't put my I arm one anywhere else. weird feelings where it's like, hey, man, you, when you had to be sitting, we're married. But sometimes when you're sitting so close to somebody, you got to put your arm around. Yeah. I'm like, eh, okay, just make sure you don't touch that person. <laughs> you can touch me because I'm actually your husband. Okay. But you know the situation I'm yeah. talking about. Oh, man, I wish I had something to talk about. Man, I went to the uh, gas station a while ago, and I was feeling kind of trying to get my creative uh, energy up for the podcast. I tell you what, I put in my uh, CD player, Pantera, cover of Cat Scratch Fever, and blasted that thing on repeat. So I got about eight doses of it at about 150 decibels because of that 95 Ford Bronco I got. I got a pretty badass sound system with the sub in the back and all that shit. 
So I was wound up pretty good. And then I go over to the gas station on the corner of Lincoln and Venice, and there's this dipshit in there in a damn black Audi, and he's got his glasses on, he's just sitting there texting. Audi seems to be like the hipster car now. What well, is the hipster car? Eh, yeah. It's a fine automobile, but this guy's just sitting there. So I give him the, I'm looking at it through the windshield, like I'm kind of giving that <laughs> heads up look like, hey, I'm pulling up into this pump. You're you're facing the way that I'm coming. So I'm giving you a chance since you're fiddle fucking on your phone and you don't have the hose <laughs> in your gas tank, you're done. I'm giving you a chance to go through and pass me by here on my passenger side. Of course, this goofy motherfucker keeps looking at his phone, so I pull right up to him about two inches from his bumper, get out, and start gassing my damn Bronco up. And, of course, finally, you know, he has enough wherewithal to back out. It's like, I don't understand. People are such st- shitty drivers, and their head- everybody's got their head up their ass these days with well, these goddamn smartphones. Well, look on the bright side. He wasn't driving and texting. No, he wasn't. But I told him, you know, I'm trying to give him a heads up because, you know, the gas uh, receptacle on the Ford Bronco was on the left rear quarter panel. So I got to pull all the way up. And he's, you know, gas tank is at the back of his vehicle. So he's pulled up like our vehicle's about to start kissing. <laughs> and mine's going to win that contest because I'm four wheel driver I'm riding up a little bit higher than him. So it's like, hey, man, I'm trying to give you some courtesy here. Work with me. <laughs> Fucking people. I don't get it. Well, I did see an article this morning, something about millennials. Uh, they did a, a research or a study that millennials are poor drivers and or uh, drivers that don't have much regard for other drivers. They don't give a fuck. <laughs> the younger set doesn't give a fuck. I don't, I don't understand it. The millennials. You know, I'd never heard the word millennials till I did that podcast about a year and a half ago with Vince McMahon. But now I get it. They're not talking, you know, I got a lot of millennials that listen to the Steve Austin show. So I ain't ragging everybody, but hell, even if you're, you, you and I would still be considered in the baby boomer section of people that we were, or I was right on yeah. the cutoff date. You might, you, you might actually be a millennial, but I'm a baby boomer. I'm not a millennial. I'm just one young year. Well, I mean, you're kind of lazy. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but, uh, I'll take more offense to that than not getting a set of Valentine's day flowers. No, <laughs> no, there are baby boomers that are just as lazy as everybody else. So I don't think you can just put it on an entire generation, but I'll tell you what, back in the old days, I mean, like when we grew up in Edna, Texas, if you didn't work your goddamn ass, well, bottom line was you were going to work your ass up because that's kind of how, so we got brought up in. Well, you know what I notice when I go to my mom's house? She lives in a 55 and old, over, older senior community, but most of the seniors there have their adult children living with them, which is strange because I would never move in with my mother. Yeah, but here's the thing. That's the fucked up thing about California. <laughs> it's so expensive here. I can almost get it. Like when I came here from Texas 12 years ago and I saw those sticker prices on everything, I said, holy shit. Are it's these motherfuckers yeah. crazy? And when these people move over to Texas or Nevada or some of the other states, they think everything's real cheap. So they drive the prices up because to them it is cheap compared to what they're paying in California. So I don't know how someone would come to this town, buy a crib, and just like on, on the west side or in, you know, just the normal towns, uh, Venice, Marina del Rey, Santa Monica is very expensive, or Burbank. I had a couple of buddies that live over in Burbank, but even shit overs through the fucking roof. You can't find nothing here for less than, damn near less than a million dollars. You can pay, well, you got a close associate that just bought a crib, a uh, two bedroom, one bath, cost $700,000. Who bought that? Your friend. Oh, yeah, Amy did, yeah. Well, you ain't got to mention her name. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> so, anyway, but I mean, 700 G's. Yeah, it's a lot of damn money. For uh, a, a two bedroom, salt. one bath uh, crib with a 4,000 square foot yard. Yeah. Four th- not a, not a 4,000 square foot house, a 4,000 square foot yard. <laughs> so, I mean, no when, lot, the entire lot's 4,000, yeah, including the that's, house. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So, like I said, man, well, I just don't know how people make it over here. And that was affordable for her. Yeah, I mean, you got lucky. You bought your house back in 99 when it getting was good. I mean, we bought... But well, it wasn't good when I was buying it. Well, no. But, I mean, I could still barely afford it. Yeah, but like when we, when we brought out 316 Gimmick Street, I mean, we bought on the high side. And I was yeah. like, Jesus Christ. I'm going to get back in wrestling. <laughs> Shit. Well, anyway, fuck uh, uh, talking about the price of uh, housing over here. Is anything going on in your world? You want to promote your Twitter account? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, did you know that today is my second part of my conversation with Paul Roma? 
No, I didn't. You don't know who Paul Roma is, do you? No. <laughs> but you don't know who anybody in is in professional wrestling. Paul Roma is a guy I used to work with way back in the day, and he got into WWF. In about 84, 85, we already covered this part of our conversation last time I talked to him. Got part of a tag team as Young Stallions. Him and his partner didn't get along. His partner was showing up to work drunk and stuff like that. Paul was having to work three quarters, 90% of the damn match. Everybody got tired of the other guy showing up blasted. So then he gets in with uh, a real uh, cool guy, Hercules, uh, Ray Hernandez. He was a good dude. I always liked talking to him. Big-ass physique. They were a great tag team. They should have had a lot better run than they did. And then uh, he goes back into a singles role. Uh, they fire him. or he No, he leaves. He leaves WWF. He leaves WWF, comes down to WCW. And, you know, that's when me and Paul had a couple singles matches, had some tag matches. As a matter of fact, back when I was part of the Hollywood Blondes, Chris, and we were the world tag team champions, myself and Brian Pillman. Well, Brian was injured one particular night, and my good buddy, Lord Stephen Regal, filled in for Brian, and Arn Anderson and Paul Roma beat us for the belts that night. Huh. So I guess you got some, <laughs> kind of a grudge against him since he stole my damn title belt. Paul, I want my motherfucking belt back. That was a long time ago. Does he still have it? No, I'm kidding. Oh, oh. No. So Paul uh, is in, uh, he's in the Connecticut area now. And uh, he was my guest on the show last Thursday. We got started about halfway through a story and talking about power and glory. Now we're going to talk about some other things to talk about some WCW stuff. But, hey, I'm going to take care of some business here. I appreciate you joining in and helping me out on the podcast, Kristen. Well, will you help me get out of the chair? <laughs> After I finish doing my open. <laughs> this is the Steve Austin Show. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's simple. Go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. This is Steve Austin Unleashed. And hey, let me ask you a question. For, I want to ask you a little bit about power and glory. Um, sure. Your pacing in the ring, man, even from your green days, you were never a guy that rushed anything from the early tape that I was able to get on you through YouTube. But in particular, like when you when you were a young stallion, uh, power and glory, pretty wonderful. Uh, anytime you were single, you never rushed anything. You're pacing in the ring. You could hit the gas pedal. You were athletic, do high spots and stuff like that. How did you learn at such an uh, early age the, the pacing that you had? You were deliberate. If you were a heel, you were in stalking mode. You were physical, great working punch. All your shit looked good. You laid it in, but you weren't crushing people. But tell me about your pacing, because I, I don't see you fumbling around for a bunch of shit. You, you, everything that you did meant something. And, and, you know, as you know, Paul, one of the biggest mistakes green guys make is rushing things. I did it for about a year and a half, maybe two, three, maybe even more. Did Tony Altamar teach you that? Was that a food? No. Or Harley? No. Who was no, that? No, it came from um, my kickboxing. Really? My fighting. It's a stock method. Like, if I go into a restaurant, even today, I'll size people up in there. If something is to happen, I know if it's that guy, then, I, you know, I know what I'm going to do to take him out. And and that's how I worked it in the ring. I worked it as a as a shoot, but I know it was a work. So I could turn it on, you know, turn the jets on at any time. But my whole method behind it was to size up my opponent. And that, that's how I did it. I, almost like a, you know, like a, an animal stalking their prey. And that's how I... That's how I look at them. How long did it take you to pick up the business? I mean, I know, I know we talked about when the light went on, but now with respect to your fighting background or your kickboxing stuff, uh, and, and you, the light went on for you, but from a mechanical standpoint, did, did you grab a hold of the business at a rapid pace? Well, some people would say six weeks. And you would say? I would say at least eight. But Eight you know, weeks? Eight, yeah. Eight weeks in the business? that I had everything down and moving. And then I started, you know, bringing things up to a higher level. Um, guys couldn't understand what I was doing at the school because they didn't have the athleticism. 
So when I was, you know, doing things, trying things, you know, like the straddles, you know, running over people like a hurdle, you know, catching a backflip off off a backdrop, you know, just different things like that. You know, someone give me a monkey flip and me landed on my feet. You know, I say, hey, listen, monkey flip me, I'm going to land on my feet, you know, and I try that and different things. Um, yeah. Well, take me back to your, your kickboxing or your fighting background. When did you start that stuff? Woo, um, I kickboxed, gosh, damn, I don't know, I had to be 16, 17, 18 in that area, about 16, uh, a, a fighter, uh, Matty Malisi, um, tremendous, I mean, he was like, he was like a Bruce Lee, the guy was like 135 pounds, I was 245, I could put my foot over my head, you know, in a full stretch, and when this guy hit you, I mean, you felt all of 135 and then some. I was only allowed to fight the black belts because I was taking out everybody in, in the class. I get them in a compromising position, and then I let them know that I had them, and then I back off. So I had to fight the instructors because, I mean, they couldn't even leg sweep me off my feet. Wait, okay, I, here's the thing. I enjoyed it, man. But I've heard, I've heard some stories of guys taking a couple of shots at you, uh, and you told a guy, hey, man, I really don't want to do this. And <laughs> as long as you've been in the business, uh, and in some of those Wild West days back in New York, or, you know, dude, even back in WCW, those was still kind of the Wild West days, you know, in the early 90s. So how did it come to be that, I mean, you, I never heard of you getting in a scuffle with any of the boys? No, I... I like I like I told you before, I think they they feared me or they respected me, but either one for me was good. Um, I didn't want to fight. My 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 biggest fear is what I'm capable of doing. So you know, when I was in New York, I got in a well, not really a fight, but we were in uh, Rosemont, and uh, Coco Beware said I said something about him, and I said I I thought he was joking. You know, and he, and he started, you know, cussing at me. And I was like, dude, relax. I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And he punched me in the face. And I stood there and I, you know, for me, if I punch you in your face, Steve, and you don't go down, chances are I'm going to apologize to you and tell you I'm sorry. I don't know where, what happened, where it came from. Because if I can't take you out, you know, I hit you like that. I got to figure you're tough, man, you know. So he punches me in my face, and I told him, listen, dude. I said, you know, I don't want to fight. I said, I don't want to get fired. I said, so please, you know, enough. So he punched me two more times in the face. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I I, I got to stop this guy before, you know. But I don't want to hurt him. So I just grabbed him and, and kind of tucked his head by my side, you know, put my arm over his head and tucked it by my side. And then I'm standing there, and I feel – him biting me i'm like this son of a bitch is biting me and i'm that calm about the whole thing i mean i'm trying to stay as calm as possible so i said well let me like pull him down if i could pull him down then i could just kind of like hold him down so when i went to pull him it, it's i just slipped and i ended up on my back and he was on top of me and i said all right well we got to take this out of you know we got to get him off because this is not a good position to be in so i got him off me and he's like, I'm going to kick your ass. And I'm standing there saying to myself, you just punched me three times in the face. You can't kick my ass. What is it you're not getting? So I gave him a quick bip with a left, and it stopped him. It just stopped him in his tracks. And the Lanza jumped in, and I was trying to keep Lanza in between us. You know? So then, you know, he starts crying. I'm going to go to the office. You know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, here goes my job. You know, this guy's going to bitch. They, they're giving him the push. So then I said, well, you know what? I'm going to get fired. What the hell? So I went downstairs to this, where he was uh, had his own room. Um, and I knocked on the door. And he said, who is that? I said, it's Roma. Open up. I'm going to kick the shit out of you. So he goes, you know, you know, fuck off. I'm going to the office tomorrow. I said, open up the door. You know, and I threw in a few choice words. I said, I'm going to beat the living shit out of you, dude. Open up the door, man. You know? So he's like, no, nah, go away, go away. So I walked away. Pat grabbed me the next day and said, uh, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, what's up? He says, I heard you got in a fight last night. I said, I didn't get in a fight. And he looked at me startled. I'm like, what do you mean you didn't get in a fight? I said, I didn't get in a fight. 
You got in a fight with Coco last night. I said, no, I didn't, Pat. I said, Coco punched me like three times in the face. I said, but I don't consider that fighting. I didn't really hit him back. So he looked at me dumbfounded. And he's like, well, I, I guess. I said, yeah. I said, so you know what? I don't think there's anything to talk about because I didn't fight him. So he let me go, which is fine. Yeah. And then we got on a plane probably a week or two later. And Coco's sitting in the back, and I went walking back there. And the boys are like, oh, shit, here it goes, right? And I walk back, and he, goes, he looks up at me. He goes, hey, man. He goes, uh, sorry about that. And I said, about what? He goes, you know, what happened in Chicago? I said, that's all right, dude. There's nothing you could do to hurt me. And then I just walked away and sat down. I figured that would, you know, get him riled up. But, nah, he wouldn't jump. So, you know, no big deal. And so, But anyway, yeah, that, I'm, I'm just afraid of, you know, what I could do to somebody. I know how like disturbed I get. I know what kind of punches I can take, especially from kickboxing. I mean, you know, they, they give you those kicks in the head and the face and you just keep coming. And that's why I had to fight the instructors. Cause you know, I had four friends that joined the class with me and they wouldn't fight me. And, and they, and two of them were cops and they would not fight me. Are you an MMA fan? Um, not a great fan of it. Once in a while, I watch it if it's on, you know, like late night. So it was your idea to come up with Power and Glory? Yes. Because they weren't doing nothing with you. They weren't doing nothing with Ray. So you run this idea by them, and then you pitch it to the office. Yeah. I remember when you guys hooked up because you had a great look. Because I like Ray when he's Hercules. I yep. like you from your work. And then to me, uh, Young Stallions was good because I remember you guys are athletic, good-looking uh, tag team. I didn't know about Jim's issues, whatever. Y'all disappear. But I thought when you guys come up with power and glory and, and going back, I, th I think WWF messed out on a major run with you guys because they did some good – y'all did some good things with some good people. But to yeah. me, y'all were a main event, high-level tag team that they should put the gas pedal to. Do you feel the same way? Without a doubt. Um, even the Hart Foundation said it. He said, there's nobody better than you guys. Bret Hart told me one day, he goes, you guys are great. You're the best tag team I've ever seen. And he goes, it's a shame they're not giving you a push. We beat the Hart Foundation in Nassau Coliseum uh, for the belts. And then they they uh, immediately took the belts away from us and said, you know, that uh, we cheated. You know, that was obviously the angle. Um, it was deafening in the, in that place. The people cheered, and I turned to Ray, and I was like, holy shit, man. I said, you you hearing this? I said, they're they're cheering us. We're the fucking heels. They're cheering us. They're, they're, they're cheering us over the Heart Foundation, dude. I said, we're over, man. And then they took the belts, and Ray looks at me, and he says, uh, you'll never see those belts again. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you'll, we'll never see those belts again. And he was right. Why do you think that was? What was it? I think they that I created power and glory, and the office didn't. That's what I think. That's my, just my opinion. I think that Vince, like he did with uh, with Luger, he'll pour you know a million, a hundred million, whatever he needs to do to get somebody over, and, and he wants to make it work. Not that he could with Luger because he just didn't have any charisma, but that's another story. But he didn't create us, and we were over. I said, you know, why don't we get Power and Glory shirts? And he said, ah, oh, heel stuff doesn't sell. And I said, okay. I said, well, I'll tell you what, Vince, how about if I bankroll it and Ray and I keep the money from what we sell? And he goes, uh, well, let me think about it. Let me think about it, <laughs> you know? And then, and then that was it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, yeah, he just, yeah, we, we had a good run. I mean, not a great run? No, no, no. It wasn't a great run, but they didn't put the gas behind you. The The run was what it was. But uh, by all accounts, with the combination of chemistry that you guys had together, him the power guy, you you the, the, the finesse guy, the move guy, uh, you know, the, the good-looking guy, he's the heater, uh, strong. Uh, yep. Dude, it was just a perfect combination. And with your athletic ability, you hit the gas pedal. I mean, and, and Ray could do great dynamic stuff anyway. But I just yep. thought that was it was a it was a great tag team that just it was one of those things that could have been a lot greater than what it was if they had just let it up. You brought up a name, Lex Luger. Were you there for the whole Lex Express? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Well, what happened? You you brought that name up. Uh, a lack of charisma. What, what was his problem when he when he went to New York? 
You know, I, I never spoke to anybody after, you know, after that, as far as, you know, what was going on and, you know, why this wasn't working, why that wasn't working. He, he just, he didn't have it. He, he just, you know, you, you have it. Um, he didn't have it. You know, Vince could put a thousand dollars behind you and, and, and he can get you, you can get, well, I should say he could get you over. You can get over. Um, you're likable. You have a personality, um, you know, baby face, heel, it doesn't matter. You know, people are going to love you. They're going to hate you. They're going to love to hate you. Um, Luger didn't have that. You know, he was just that guy. He, he didn't, he wasn't, a, to me, he wasn't a good looking guy. I'll tell you if a guy's good looking. He wasn't a good looking guy. You know, he was a, he was a big man, decent body, but he has, he had no charm. And no matter how much money Vince put behind him, it didn't matter. He really had a hard time connecting with the people. I think when he was down there in uh, World Championship Wrestling, uh, working with Flair every night, Jesus Christ, I don't know, what was that 88 or whenever it was? I can't remember. It's been so long ago. Or it was it later? It, it might have been 88. Yeah, it was, it was in that era. But, I mean, working with Flair for two years, and Flair got him over about as high as he was going to get over. And then the, I remember him leaving. You know, I remember his, his old run there. You know, I watched it from afar. And then I remember when he went to New York, and I was going to wonder what they were going to do with him. But, you know, I'm not speaking badly of, of the man or talking behind his back, but, you know, Rick no. Flair got him over down in WCW. But, you know, that was that was what Rick Flair did. And he came right. to New York, and, man, they built that Lex Express, and they really bankrolled him. Man, he just couldn't, going back to trying to play this podcast for your students, he really couldn't um, identify, or the people, could, and in my opinion, couldn't identify with who or what he was. Whether, you know, you're working heel, Paul, or whether you're working baby, you've got to establish a relationship with that crowd. You know, you're, you're not selling yourself, you're, but you're trying to get over in the form of love or hate. And he just, he just, he, to me, he generated neither. Yeah, he doesn't have that it factor. He just doesn't have it. Again, you know, it, you know, people think that I hate Ric Flair. I don't hate Ric Flair. You know, I try to tell people, you know, they ask me, how was it, you know, work as a horseman? I said, it was very confusing. When I was with Arn, everything was fine. When Rick stepped into the picture, he confused the hell out of me. We don't do this. We do that. We don't do that. We don't do this. We don't do that. And I was after a while, I was like, you know what? I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. You know, you don't do this. You don't do that. You know, I mean, you're picking on petty shit. You know, you want me to go out there and beat the shit out of somebody? I can do that. You know, is that what you guys want? Well, no. Well, then what do you want? Well, we're not heels and we're not baby faces. Okay. And we don't do this. And we don't do that. If you're going to do that, do that. You know, I just... So, you know, it is what it is. Hey, man, well, okay, let's come back to that. But let's let's close out WWF. How, why did you leave the WWF? Uh, we were in France, uh, Ray and I, and they were putting us in single matches. So I went up to Pat Patterson. I said, hey, Pat, I said, what's going on, man? I said, you're splitting Ray and me up. Like, you know, you're beating my big man out there, and you beat my big man. We're no good anymore. So... Uh, he goes, oh, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry. I said, well, I am worried about it, Pat. I said, because, you know, I mean, what the hell? Why are we doing singles? Well, you know, we're just, we're going to do some stuff. You know, don't worry, though. You're going to, we're going to take care of you. I said, well, take care of me. I said, well, what about Ray? Well, he'll be okay. I said, he'll be okay. Okay doesn't work for me. I said, you know, you're splitting us up. This is bullshit. I said, you know what, Pat? I'm done. And he goes, what? I said, I'm done. I had enough of this. So he goes, no, 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 listen, listen, you know, you're going to be going home tomorrow. Think about it. I said, no, think about it. I'm telling you right now, I'm done. <laughs> so I walk. So I go into Vince's office after I get back to the States. I sit down with him. I tell him. He got all heated. You know, I told him, I said, you know, I said, I, I gave my, my balls to you, man. I said, nobody worked as hard as I worked with the injuries that I had. I said, now you got guys that get a hangnail. They're out for a week. And then Vince started screaming, you know, I took care of you. I said, took care of me. I said, I could have lost my arm in that WrestleMania. And I still went out there because you begged me to go out there because we were wrestling against Demolition. I said, Ray had a torn groin. He retore it the night before. He could hardly move. 
I said, my elbow, they told me in the hospital I could lose it if I land on it, yet I still went out there for you. You took care of me? You do shit for me. So he swelled up, you know, then started swelling up. And I said, you better sit your ass down. I ain't fucking playing with you. And he was at the under end of the table. I said, I'm done. I said, so have a good life, basically, you know, on my way. Walked out the door, never looked back. That was it. Goddamn. Um, what was the deal with your arm? What was the arm injury? I messed up my, my elbow. So I went to the hospital and they said, listen, if you land on this elbow, there's a good chance you could lose your arm. And I was like, okay. So I went back, obviously my arm in a sling that they put it in. And Vince was in a meeting and, and they called him out of it. And he saw me in the sling and he's like, you know, what the hell is this? And I said, I got to talk to you, man. And I told him what they told me. And he's, he was like, please, Paul, please, I need you in this match. You know, that's why they cut the demolition match down to like one minute. Because we were both a mess. And then they're like, you know, can you take that off the, off his shoulders? And I'm like, holy shit. You know, I'm like, yeah, I guess. So I went out and bought a, um, a uh, roller blade or a, a skater's elbow pad. Uh, we patted it all up, put it on my arm, took the bump, tried to land a little, you know, cockeyed. So I won't land on the arm. And then when I got back to the locker room, they had a doctor waiting, and he took 30 cc's of fluid out of my elbow. He says, I don't take 30 cc's out of a knee, and I took 30 cc's out of your elbow. And I was like, well, we made it through, man, you know? So that was it. Then I went to TV like a day or two later in Vegas, and I walked in. They're like, yeah, you're not working. Just go relax somewhere. So, so. what ultimately was the uh, case with the elbow? I don't know. I mean, it healed, you know, whatever the hell it was. Okay, so you, you, let me ask you this. You go out of the door of the WWF, you walk into the doors of WCW, you call them, they call you. I called, I was watching TV, I was watching wrestling, and I looked up at the screen and I said, you know what, this is bullshit. I belong there, you know, meaning working. So I called uh, Janie Ingle. Yep. And uh, she answered the phone anyway. I didn't know who she was then, but, and, uh, you know, I told her who I was, and, and I said I was interested in coming in. So I said, okay. And uh, I got a call from, uh, I don't remember his name, and he said, uh, you know, this is so-and-so. And I said, yes, I know who you are. And he said, we'd like to bring you in, and we'd like to make you a horseman. And I was at my gym at the time and, and uh, behind the counter, and I said, okay. He says, and, uh, you know, this is what we're going to give you. And I said, okay. He goes, no, I don't think you understand. And I, and I said, no, I understand. He goes, no, I don't think you do. See, we're going to make you a horseman, and this is what we're going to pay you. And you're good with it? And I said, yes, I'm good. Yeah, I don't think you, you quite understand. I said, I understand. Because <laughs> what they thought was they were, they were giving me a little bit of money. Right. But being, you know, like you, a businessman, I figured, because they told me, listen, you're only going to work like once or twice a month. But I knew if they were making me a horseman, I was going to be working more than once or twice a month. I had to be. So that money was going to compound, you know, exponentially. So that's what I did. I went down there. Nobody knew. Uh, Dusty talked to me. Uh, It was an ultra kayfabe. When I walked into uh, Atlanta, into whatever that building was, people looked like they saw a ghost when I walked through that door, man. And then I walked out to the stage, and Dusty looked at me, and he said, I said, hey, Dust. He goes, Paul, pre-Paul Roma. He goes, yeah, baby, come over here. Give me a hug. Give me some love. So I walked over, gave him a big hug. He goes, pretty Paul. You know what? That's what I'm going to call you, pretty Paul Roma. And that's what he called me, pretty Paul Roma. So what was the deal with the horseman? Some people said that you didn't fit in, or it was some people's take that you didn't like being a horseman, what was it? Because you just laid down 10 minutes ago a bunch of rules that say, hey, we don't do this, we do this, we don't do that. And they kind of, I don't know, there's a bunch of rules being laid down there, what you do and you don't do. And I heard you on another uh, interview say, like, hey, man, when uh, the boss says, or, or the, the powers that be, we want you to be a horseman, what are you going to do? Say, no, I don't want to be a horseman. 
hey, that's a pretty good gig, or you're going to be the world champion. No, I don't want to be the world champion. So you get handed this gig. What are you supposed to do? Turn it down or say yes? Because you're looking to cross into a different promotion. So you're a horseman. Uh, excited about it before you meet everybody, or, or you probably pass by them if they came through WWF. But what was the story on your first entrance in? Heat, no heat, ambivalent. They brought you in with open arms. What was the fucking story? Because I hear so many conflicting things. Well, I mean, you know, I, I went in there happy, you know, going to be a horseman. Obviously, Dusty welcomed me with open arms. Uh, Ole Anderson grabbed me pulled me in a little room and and say hey listen man he goes you know they told me that you know you're a good worker you know we want to put women in the seat you're a good looking guy you got a good body so you know i uh, goes i don't know they say you're a good worker but i've never seen you work and right off the rip i said to myself you know what i think this guy's full of shit i mean how could you bring somebody in you don't know how he works you've never seen him work come on man you pulling my chain i'm saying to myself so right off the bat i'm like okay this guy's an asshole I don't get along with him because he's already lying to me. I just got to assume that. Is it wrong to assume? Yeah, but you know what? Come on. You don't look at the product before you bring it in. I find that really hard to believe. <laughs> right? Yeah. All right. So now I, I go over. I put my tuxedo on, and, and you know, I, I they announce me. And obviously, you know, these people don't want me. I'm from WWF. They don't want me. I don't fit down south. You know, whatever. I don't give a shit what they want. I'm going out there, so I go. And Rick lays down this speech that was the best of the best. I mean, you know him as mouth. He's yeah. phenomenal. Um, you know, and I come into the room, you know, and, and, and they're all there. And, you know, I mean, we're it looked to be okay. And then afterwards, it, it seemed to be all right, especially with Arn. Arn, Arn took me in, um, you know, with open arms. Um, you know, invited me to his home, which I thought was great. And um, but but when he got around Rick, or Rick got around him, we were all three of us were together. It was a different story. It was a different picture. Um, I started noticing when we went out. Uh, I started getting you know more attention than than Rick did, and I think that bothered him. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I could say whatever. You know, what's the truth? I don't know. I just believe that to be. Uh, I just saw some. I don't know, jealousy, animosity. Um, he's not the big, he's not the dog anymore. Got a young stud in town, you know what I mean? Definitely better looking than you, definitely better built than you, you know? So now what? What do you do? You know, how do you keep promoting you? So, like I said, Arn and I, I, I thought we got along just fine. You know, did we gel body-wise? No, we we're freaking frack, let's face it. We're definitely what was the feeling in WCW versus WWF? Just laid back. Laid back? Laid back. Oh, yeah. So, so? No, no stress. WWF, you're like high-intensity stress. Well, everybody's WCW, no spots. Stress. Why, why then in WCW did you feel like no stress? I, I don't know. I just didn't feel like, you know, anybody was gunning for you. In WWF, you just, from from the office people down, Somebody's always looking to set someone else up, you know, get them to say something, get open up a spot for the new guy. You know, it's always something going on. And WCW wasn't like that. You just sat there and, you know, you played cards and everybody joked and got along. Yeah, it was definitely different. Was it because of uh, guaranteed money, do you think? Because, you know, when you came in WCW, when I came there in 92, 91, whatever, I went over there. After I just broke into business for a year and a half in USWA, you know, they called me up and talked to Dusty, and they brought you in for X amount of dollars the first year, and your second year you'd probably double that. And so, you you know, it was guaranteed money. But you still had to earn your spot on the card. You know, WWF, I mean, you know, nothing was guaranteed, nothing. You just signed a contract, but that, that was it. So, right. I mean... <laughs> Dude, it was like the Wild West back then. I mean, dude, you're, you you know the higher you are on the card, the more money you're going to make. And so oh, yeah. I just think that breeds competition in and of itself. And you, you always want to try to get to the top. But uh, may, maybe that was it just because, you know, you still had to work for your spot. But oh, I, 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 I can tell you one thing. I was in the ring with Brutus Beefcake when I first started out. Uh, we are doing TV. And I grabbed, you know, a headlock on him. <laughs> And when he came back to the locker room, 
one of one of my buddies that I went up there with had said, you know, come here, I want to tell you something. I said, what's up? He goes, Hogan just gave Beefcake a bunch of shit. And I said, you know, what's that to do with me? He goes, well, he was telling Beefcake, he better get into the gym because you were making him look really bad in there. I'm like, oh, great. You know, just what I need, right? I need this guy to be pissed at me because, you know, he looks like shit and I work out. Not my fault. But, you know, again, that's that's the problem that, you know, guys were – in WWF, they were gunning for your spot. They were worried about their spot. You know, there was like, there were a bunch of insecure people, but not the old timers now, not the old timers. You know, the Fugees and, and the Harley races, you know, they, they just weren't, those guys weren't worried about their spots. You know, it, it seemed more like the, the young guys. Always worried. It just it was crazy. Then looking back at just the atmosphere of the locker rooms, which which run did you prefer? What happened in WWF or what happened down there in WCW? Not according w- not, yeah. not according to your push, but just the atmosphere. I think the WWF. You know why? Because it was had to do with partners. You know, I ran with Ray. I ran with SD Jones. You know what I mean? I had great runs as far as friendship runs with these people. Yeah, so when I went down to WCW, um, until I hooked up with Orndorff, when he walked up to me and said, hey, I did go to, you know, he did, like he said, he comes up in my face like, hey, hey, uh, I think you're going to put us together. I'm like, oh, that's, I, that's great. He goes, you like that? And I said, well, yeah. He goes, oh, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you told me you liked it. You know, and I said, yeah, dude, are you kidding me? Me and you together? Absolutely. He goes, got to come up with a name, got to come up with a name for us. So I said, well, just give me a minute, man. Let me think, you know. So he walks away, and all of a sudden, I just, he walks by me, and I go, holy shit, I got it, man. And so I go, come here, I got our name. He goes, what? I said, well, you're wonderful, right? Wonderful. He goes, yeah. And I'm pretty Paul, right? He goes, yeah. I said, we're pretty wonderful. He goes, I love it. You know, he goes, ooh, 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 I, I love it. Let's go tell the agent now. So we ran in and told the agent, and that's the name we went with. How'd you like hanging around, Paul? Oh, he was, he's tremendous. He's aces, man. I love his hunting stories, you know, um, just it, just the family guy that he is, uh, stand-up guy that he is. Uh, you, you know, you, you hand them, you hand them something, you, you don't have to worry about him, you know, taking it from you. It's a rarity, man, when you find, you know, the chosen few people that, that you could actually put your life, give them your life and say, you know, will you take care of this for me? And it's going to be there when you get back. Yeah, you I, agree, know, I agree with you on Paul, but, yeah, but that was Paul, a stand-up guy. If, if Paul shook your hand and looked in the eye and told you something, that was it. End of story. That's how it was. Whether it's good, bad, and different, if Paul told you something, he would tell you to your face, and that's how it was. He was a, he was a total man of his word. Yep. He sure was, man. He sure was. All right, Paul. Let me take a pause for the calls here, and we'll pick it back up right after this. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. Hey, what was the deal? I was watching some of your stuff uh, on YouTube. You got to give me the Alex Wright story. Because <laughs> here's the thing, I was, I, I'd been watching. Uh, I watched that match, and I remember uh, that was one of the. Uh, he was part of the promo I cut when I went to ECW, and so I started watching a bunch of other guys have matches with him. And man, they were trying to push this kid through the moon. And I saw the match you had with him. And uh, was that the reason you got fired from WCW or not? Oh yeah. Okay, so oh, yeah. what was your attitude going uh, to the ring? Well, the well, well, let's just start off with the ma- let's just start off with the match instructions and how you took all this. Well, what went down? Okay, well, what led up to it? So the the agreement that Rick Flair and I in the office had was that I would let this kid beat me all around, but teach him how to wrestle. And I and I said yes, but I'm not getting beat on pay per view. And they said absolutely not. Just all the house shows, we want you to teach this kid, get him over, you know, because he's still green. And I said, not a problem. You know, we'll set up the angle with you. I said, okay, great. I said, but no paper. I'm not doing job on, on a pay-per-view. And they said, not a problem, not going to happen. 
So now pay-per-view comes up, and I go walking in <laughs> thinking, okay, they're going to DQ me uh, something, you know, interference, I don't know. So I walk up to, uh, you know, the board, and, and there's I'm trying to see what match I'm on, and uh, Rick comes over. And I say, hey, Rick, I say, he goes, hey, Paul, I say, hey, you know, wh- how do you want us to do this? What do you want to do? And I said, oh, we need him over. And I went, excuse me? And he goes, yeah, we need him over. And I said, well, wait, Rick, you know, we had an agreement. I wasn't going to job to this guy on TV. He goes, yeah, well, the office changed their mind. And I said, oh, the office changed their mind, huh? He goes, yeah. Okay, how do you want it? So he tells me. So I'm like, okay. So obviously I walk all the way out with attitude. I said, as soon as this kid gets in the ring, I'm just going to insult him for however long it takes. And when it comes down to a three count, I'm going to kick out on two and a half. They could do whatever they want. After that, I could give two shits. So, and that's probably the highest I ever jumped off a top rope to drop an elbow. <laughs> Brother, I was up there. I, I was coming down saying, damn, I could just sandwich on the way down. I'm up here. <laughs> I was just having a conversation, man. I, I, I really was. You know, here's the thing, because uh, uh, I can't remember if I had to put him over or not. I probably did, but, you know, it was, it was the, I probably got the same speech you got. But, you know, the, the it, was, it wasn't his fault. Nice looking kid. I didn't know yeah. whatever happened to him. They, they wanted him to get over, but. You know, it just seemed like he, he's probably a good kid, but I don't think anybody really likes selling for him. To be quite frank with you. And uh, anyway, uh, like I said, nice guy, but I didn't I didn't know him. I worked with him. And uh, what happened when you went back to the dressing room? Nothing. That's the thing. I walked back there. No one said a word to me. I went out to a restaurant with Paul, Janie Ingle. Um, myself, I think someone else was us, and a couple of the other guys. I think Rick may have been in the restaurant, too. Um, and Paul said, man, that was a hell of a match you had, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I leave, I, I get home, and I get a call from Rick. And he said, hey, uh, you know, I just, I don't think you want to wrestle anymore. And I said, what are you talking about? I don't want to wrestle anymore. He goes, well, that match you had. I said, I thought it was a damn good match, Rick. He goes, well, I didn't think so. I said, well, then you're the only one because everybody I talked to thought it was great. All the boys thought it was a good match. He goes, well, you know, I don't think you want to wrestle anymore. I said, you know, Rick, I really don't give a fuck what you think. I said, so, you know, end of conversation. You know, I mean, I I can see where this is going. So he had nothing else to say. Next, you know, I get a FedEx package saying that they no longer need my services. Finish out, you know, the rest of your bookings. And that was it. Okay, fine. So... Then I make a call to Europe. They call me back. I become European champ. And they told me when I was in Europe, had Alex Wright beat you, you wouldn't be here. You would have just destroyed everything that you stood for, letting that kid get over on you. So, you know what? To this day, I have no regrets about that. And again, nothing against him. It was against the business. And it was to protect my ass. Man, I tell you what, I've been in that spot a couple times, and they say, hey, man, we ain't going to beat you, or we're going to do this. And then all of a sudden, on the big day, and, you know, a couple hours before the match, hey, man, you'd like, like I said, want the kid over. And it's like, hey, man, we had an agreement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the office, and the heat always goes to the office. And like, yeah. all right, you're in, you're in between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. I'll never forget, man. I was, uh, I'd been working down there in WCW, and my uh, shit, I can't remember how long I'd been there. I was new, I was still pretty new in the business, but I was having pretty good matches. And I just got finished working a loop with Sting. You know, Sting, Jesus Christ, man. You know, he was one of our top, the top guy. I was yeah. having great matches with Sting. And, you know, he was beating me every night. Then I was having great matches with Ricky Steamboat. And, and you know, either he was beating me every night or we were doing Broadways, whatever. But I was going toe to toe with these guys, and a lot of more Broadways. But I, I put a lot of them over too, a Sting and Steamboat. And then all of a sudden, hey man, I want you to uh, work a loop with Eric Watts, and so um, we start working Broadways with Eric Watts. And I'm thinking, okay, 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden, hey man, I want you to put the kid over. And I was like, man. I just got finished working some hellacious barn burners with Sting, Steamboat, and I was good enough to, to do Broadways with the kid, and now you really want me to put him over. Yep. And Grizzly Smith was giving me these instructions. Well, I, I remember, Grizz. Yep. I said, Grizz, I ain't doing it. 
And uh, he goes, well, Steve, why not? I said, I ain't. I said, man, I've been having these bust-ass matches with Sting and Steamboat, and I don't see myself getting beat by Eric Watts. And nothing against Eric Watts, but, you know, shit, he was just six months in the fucking business. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was, it, there comes a time, not in everyone's career, you're either going to get fucked on money, and you got to learn about money. you got to learn about the business. We'll keep going, going, trying to get this thing back to something that your students can take away from it. you got to learn the money game. you got to learn the political game or how to play your cards, how to be a businessman. And then sometimes, you know, as part of that businessman, you know, is when to put your foot down because... You know, you didn't. They told you that you weren't going to get beat. Then all of a sudden, they pulled the rug out from from you, and you got to do the favors. Well, all of a sudden, that rug got pulled. It was only a, it was only a spot show. It was a house show. But I said no. And the very next day, I think I showed on a Friday. The next business day was a Monday, and I got, got called right into Dusty's office because once I ref, once I refused, he put the call in. We did a Broadway, and that's when I got called in. He goes, Steve, he goes, why did you do that? And I told him, I said, hey, man, I said, I think I'm better than that. And he goes, this almost cost you your job. I said, well, I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way I feel. And anyway, they kept me on, and I didn't get fired, but I held my ground. And that, that was just one thing that I had to do at that time. Yep. And you know what? And this is what I tell my students. I said, listen, I'll never stop, ask you to stop being the, the person or the man that you are, but don't do anything, you know, in that ring, you know, to, to disgrace who and what you are. You got a problem with someone, take it outside. Don't do it in there, man. There's a, there's a place for everything. Live and die by the sword that you're, that you're wheeling, because that's what I live by. You know, the sword cuts both ways, but if you're good with the way it cuts you, then you could live with that. I can live with the decision that I made as you made that decision. And who knows where it would have taken you had you done the job in that spot show. You don't know. You can't go back and, you know, and relive it. But I know in my heart that it was the right move. You know, and, and when these guys, my students get in these independent shows and I tell them, listen, man, you got to start thinking what's best for you. Who, how many people are out there? Ten? 20 and, and and you're getting paid what ten dollars twenty dollars is it worth twenty dollars to get beat in 30 seconds by some jabroni you know no it's not twenty dollars isn't going to change your life so start thinking along those lines you know where you where you are on the food chain and and i'll tell you something right now i have guys you know steve in, in my school that right now hands down can work for any organization, WWE, NXT, any of them. I mean, my heavyweight champ, you know, Richard Holiday, Matias Williams, House of Pain, Sergeant Murray, Big Jim. I got a rookie, this kid, RJ. You talk about the perfect kid coming up, he listens. And, and I, these kids are like my, my kids now. I watch them and I'm this proud father when they have this phenomenal match, you know, and my guys, I think I told you, my guys had a, a ladder match the uh, last month. It was the best ladder match I've ever seen in my life. These guys can hang with the best of them, the absolute best of them. Hey, man, so how long are you working with these kids? So, uh, what is, what's the course consist of? How do people find you or get into the school? What's the system? Well, I mean, it's Paradise Alley Professional Wrestling. And I really liked, you remember the movie Paradise Alley? Of course I do. Terry Funk yeah. was in it, among others. Hell yeah. Um, I, I kind of liked that that thought pattern, you know, when, when I had opened up the school. I, I thought it was just along those lines in my brain, so to speak. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of how I, I, I looked at it. It was going to be old school, you know, just teaching psychology and, you know, don't take a hundred bumps, you know, take three or four, you know, that, that makes sense. We just landed four public access channels to get our show on TV, which is nice. So our website's under construction right now, but right now we have PAPW official Facebook is where it's at. So, so how you know, are you working with these kids, man? In the beginning, probably we go over the holes and things like that two, three times a week. Then I start, you know, bringing them in, putting things together, making them understand, 
why you do this, that, and the other thing. You know, like I have a footprint, uh, which is within the first minute, you got to figure nobody knows who you are. You have to tell the crowd without hand gestures, without swearing at them, you have to tell them who the baby face and who the heel is. And you basically have a minute to get that done. What's up next week? I got to ask you something. Go ahead. I'm going to put you on the spot. I want to know if you remember your famous tagline. Ah, shit, I can't remember. Was this a story you told me in the deer stand? No, no. This is your favorite tagline. What was it? See what I did right there, kid? Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, before we shut this thing down, what was that story you told me? Because I think uh, you thought I was disrespecting you. We was at a diner somewhere. We was on uh, a road. What what was that story? Listen, this is a a classic story, man. This is what brought us back together. So I got I to gotta tell it. So we're, we went out to get something to eat, and we're in a restaurant. And there's you, me, and I can't remember. The, there were like five of us that were in the restaurant. So they bring our food up. And, again, I got to br- put the details in. The background of me being, you know, from an Italian family, we always, when we get our food, we'll offer it to other people at the table. Would you like some? Would you like some? So me... Being from that family, I look at you and I said, hey, Steve, you know, would you like some steak? And without missing a beat, you looked at me serious and you went, if I wanted some, I just take it. (laughs) And I sat back and I went, shit, he just fucking disrespected me, man. I said, I offer him my food and he's going to take my food. (laughs) I got to I got to fight this fucking guy. This, this ain't right. We got we got to go. Now I got to fight him. This is bullshit. And then somebody said something and you all started laughing. And it was it, it obviously it was a joke. But I was like, holy shit. You know, I got to fight this. I don't want to fight this fucking guy. You know, but, you know, my thing is about respect, man. I was brought up that way. And here I offered my food. And you're just going to take it if you wanted it. <laughs> I didn't remember that story till you told me. God, I was just fucking man, with was, you. But the thing uh, about it was, yeah, you're kind of a you're kind of a serious guy until you get to know somebody. Then you fuck around. You got a great sense of humor and all that. But like you said, you're all about respect. And so I was just fucking around with you. And it was funny when you told me that story because I remember it vividly. I'd, I'd forgotten it until you told me. But no, man, I was just fucking with you. I was glad yeah, we didn't well, start fighting about a steak. <laughs> Yeah, well, I found it out a little a few minutes or whatever it was a minute later. But holy shit, the, what I went through in my brain, man! <laughs> it's like, ah, damn, you know? Oh man, you know how much stress you put on me that day. All I wanted to do was eat my food, man. I had to sit there. I wasn't even cutting it. I stopped. I'm like, damn, I'm, all this shit's going through my head. Man, oh I, and I, I immediately God. told you I was sitting in that deer stand, and uh, I told you the story that that happened because I always fuck around with people. And uh, I was down in Tennessee in the USWA territory. I just got there, and someone told me, "Hey, man, call call uh, Soul Taker. I mean, call Punisher, Mark Calloway, Undertaker." Right. He was, he was just he'd been in the business about a year longer than I have, a year and a half. Y'all see, you know, see if you can get a ride to the building with him. Fuck, you know how it is when you go to a new place. You don't know nobody. You're intimidated. You don't know the system. So I sheepishly called Mark Calloway until we start talking about getting a ride. Well, we were going to be both uh, baby faces, but they had turned him heel or some kind of shit like that. So we couldn't ride together to the building. So I had to find a different ride. It was going to be a six-man tag, uh, a six-man tag match at night, and for sure because we were on opposite sides of the ring. I said, "Okay, man." I said, "I'll find another ride." I said, "Just uh, when we get out there in the ring." I said, "I'm gonna stretch you tonight. Talk to you later." <laughs> well, goddamn, it was six-man tag. It's me and Dutch, and I can't remember who was on the, our team, but there on the other side was what ended up being the Godfather. Punisher and somebody else. Sure enough, me and Mark get in the ring. He had been on a couple tours to Japan. I was a fucking Jay Brony out of fucking Chris <laughs> Adams wrestling school. <laughs> and, uh, 
knew how to take a flat back bump, and that was about it. Didn't know no sugar holes, didn't know no shoot wrestling, didn't know a goddamn thing. So because I had disrespected the undertaker, he perceived me as smart enough to him, proceeds to put me in a couple of Japanese shoot holes. You know he's a big MMA fan to begin with. And this is back in 1990, and this motherfucker's got me in some kind of hold, and I'm just laying there. And, dude, it's, it's, it's Evansville, Indiana. I remember like it was yesterday, and I'm sitting there. He wasn't hurting me, but he was just letting me know that he had me. And so I was just sitting there, goddamn, finally he tagged out, and I tagged out, and, and Dutch Mantel was on the corner. I was on the other corner. other guy was working in the ring, and he looked at me. It was in front of about, you know, 75 people. He goes, what was that all about? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so, sure enough, they ribbed me again. He says, uh, when you get in there, go pick up Soul Taker, Godfather, and give him a body slam. So I'm like the idiot kid on the playground, right? <laughs> Tell him to go do something, he does it. So all of a sudden, me and uh, Soul Taker slash Godfather in the ring, hell, I pick him up and slam him. He said, <laughs> we get through the match, he comes up to me in the dressing room. He goes, hey, he goes, if you're going to come in there and give me a slam, he goes, either let me call it or tell me you're going to give it to me. Uh, <laughs> so I'd really pissed him off by, by picking his big ass up and slammed him. So we had work well, he had to come to Jesus meeting with him because I didn't fucking know. So <laughs> God damn it, but you and me got crossways on that steak, but I was just fucking with you. But anyway, I did it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna ride. I gotta go get my ass in the gym. Hey, let me ask you a question. You were talking yeah. about bodybuilding earlier. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that you had uh, competed. Yeah. I know you. Obviously, you were born with great genetics. What are you doing right now with your training? Uh, and how's your body feel after all the years in the business? You, you lasted about 14 years, give or take, about the same I did. Well, I got uh, two knees replaced. No shit. I got yeah. Uh, full replacements. Um, my elbows, like yours, are all messed up. Lower back shot, you know, necks still messed up. Um, but I can still move, man. Hey, listen, I, speaking of moving, why don't you bring some old ass over the hill wrestlers on your damn show, like me? I'll be 58 in April. I'm ready to tear someone's ass up. Come on, man. You done with a broken skull challenge? Sure. Oh, uh, dude, out, man. We, we, I, I'm good to go, dude. Dude, we had a guy out there. I think he was 56, 57. I can't remember, but I mean, that guy came out there and ripped some ass, and he was impressed. Yeah, but he has all his body parts. Oh, I know. That's the thing. I didn't know that you had both knees replaced. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, on, on a on a pain scale, uh, zero being pain free, ten being like shit. Where are you at on a pain scale as far as everyday life? Wow. You know what? I'm good. I, I, I guess because I got so used to, I'm at a comfort zone. So before, you know, I'd say, oh, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm like eight. You know, now it's different. Now, I guess because I'm so used to eight, I feel great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's screwed up, right? That's pretty fucked up. But I mean, you know, that's how it is. I mean, maybe it's because my young wife, I don't know, she keeps me young. Hey, man, I never knew you to be one to have any drinks or, or just even being into pills or nothing. What no. was the story for you? Because you kind of no. ran solo. Yeah, no, I didn't I didn't, I didn't. didn't drink, smoke. Was that because of your drugs. bodybuilding background or you just no, I just who you were? Uh, longevity, you know, I just, uh, I, I hate to get into that body's a temple thing, but I mean, and that's why I think, you know, not to my own horn, but I think that's why I look so damn good today and I can still get in the ring and run it. Yeah, people with good genetics. He always piss me off. <laughs> well, I hope don't get me wrong. And don't don't daughter. get me wrong. I'm not discounting all the hard work you put in the gym because you can have good genetics and not look like a million bucks if you just no. sit on your ass. So obviously you put in the work. But you know, like you could probably eat a, a dozen glazed donuts and not pay for it the same way I am. It goes straight to my waist and goes straight to your jacks. That's fucked up. <laughs> hey, listen, you know my wife hates it too. But at the end of the day. You know, I, I I do try to. I'm getting older, man. You know, it's, uh, I try to stay in good shape. That's it. That that's my thing. I got a bunch of young kids into school, and you know, if I gotta slap the shit out of somebody, you know, which I never had to, I will. But when I hit that ring, when they're pissing me off, they clear out like cockroaches with the lights turned on. <laughs> Because they know the shit is on. I'm going to hurt somebody. All right, God but, damn it. If I ever come down that, that neck of the woods, I'll stop by the school and I'll bring you a steak dinner on me. Well, yeah, yeah but you, <laughs> I'm not going to offer you any if you give it to me. 
<laughs> hey, let's ride off into the sunset. Polly, you on Twitter or anything? Yeah, mostly Facebook. I got a Twitter account, but I hardly ever go on well, it. Drop that Facebook account one more time for the listeners or anybody that's interested in the school. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, we're the number one, all joking aside, right now in the Northeast, we're the number one independent wrestling organization. We run shows every month, you know, and they're always for a charity, which is which is great. It's just PAPW official Facebook. Uh, so if they look up that, they'll be fine. And once we get our website up, you know, we'll, we'll put it on there. But, uh, yeah, good stuff, man. You know what? It's great catching up with you. It seems like, honestly, it just seems like, you know, I haven't spoken to you in, in a month. It doesn't even seem like, you know, all these years have gone by. Well, I know, it, but it was just like getting that email from your students. Like, yeah, man, me and Paul are always cool. And yeah. like I said, at the beginning of the podcast, if I do, we don't call each other all the time. But it's just always good to hook up with someone. We were, we were always cool. We, when we worked in yep. the ring, we had fun. We fucking had good matches. And it, yep. it, it just is what it is. So the real yeah. guys are the real guys. It was good talking to you, man. You too. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Watch Yellowstone for free on Pluto TV. All this weekend, Pluto TV is streaming a marathon of seasons one to three of Yellowstone, the show the rap calls a smash hit series. Pluto TV also has hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows like Mission Impossible 3, Gladiator, CSI, and more. Absolutely free. So download the free Pluto TV streaming app and watch Yellowstone seasons one to three free. Hey, this is Michael, the Playmaker Irvin, with the Michael Irvin Podcast, the MIP. Folks, we got such great guests coming towards you. We got Pat McAfee, the greatest runner in the world, and Barry Sanders. Coach Prime, that's primetime Deion Sanders. Everybody's worried about what Tom Brady's doing. Let's ask his right-hand man. My good friend Julian Edelman will be joining the MIP. And my dude Chris Long, we getting it all right here on the MIP. Don't miss it. The Michael Urban Podcast. Yo, what's good? It's your boy, Big Brother Jake, a.k.a. Jake Warner. My government name. Check it out. I host a show called the Big Brother Jake Podcast, and I've taken my talents to the biggest and baddest platform on the planet. That's right, baby. Podcast One. My show is unique, as I talk about everything. Life, sports, entertainment, being a single dad juggling several jobs. (laughs) I'm a hot mess, but it's damn entertaining. Subscribe and review now on Apple Podcasts and listen on Podcast One or wherever you get your podcasts.